Okay, hello and welcome to episode 91 of the Market Maker podcast. And before I begin, I was doing some checks on the stats for the pod. And oh, yeah. I saw that on Apple, 90% of the people who listen are followers, which is obviously great. Yeah. But only 10% are not followers. So what I'm going to ask for, you know what's coming, is if you're part of the 90%, <laughs> Pass this on to a friend or a colleague or someone you think that that might appreciate just being a bit more informed about the economy and what's going on, particularly, I think, given that what's happening right now economically impacts people at all levels uh, in all job sectors. Um, So not just for students who are applying for for these roles in finance. However, it's also good for them because I've also got a message pending in my inbox from a student saying he's got an interview tomorrow can we fast track the episode and get it out so um <laughs> uh, i'm glad it helps um, but yeah please do please do share it it'll be much appreciated from the from the both of us and the team i'm sure but on the agenda for this week then a couple of things I want to talk about 13 f filings in the u.s what are they what do they mean and in particular the reason why because i want to talk about warren buffett because he's come out with a bit of detail for us to see about what he's been buying and selling over the last quarter. And obviously someone like him with his legendary figure was you know, watching what he does. Can we get any clues over what we should be doing uh, as, as the mere mortal common man? Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we're then going to talk, we just had the UK budget. We are recording this on Thursday. So literally Jeremy Hunt's just come out and outlined the autumn budget so a couple of highlights there we'll talk about uk inflation that figure obviously came out earlier this week quite a bit higher than expected in fact the highest since 1981 printing headline year on year reading at 11.1 percent so what was underpinning that rise and what does it mean going forward and then trump he's announced he is going to run so we just want to cover really what's the process from here on out not going to touch the politics because i don't want to I don't want to cause any issues. <laughs> I'm touching the politics. <laughs> but yeah, I'll run you through the process so you know um, what to look out for in the period ahead. But you know, needless to say, you're going to get a lot more on Donald Trump. And if he's back on Twitter at some point, <laughs> that's even going to ramp up further. And then finally, um, I've got some inside info for the World Cup Ooh. that I'm going to share. It's a world exclusive. I've got a tip off. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's not from Sam North, if you're listening. It's not from because your tips are uh, <laughs> not very good. <laughs> but yeah, we'll go through that. Um, I'm going to tell you who's going to win the World Cup. So stay tuned. So kicking right. things off then. <laughs> um, Warren Buffett and 13F filing. So I guess to start with, Piers, perhaps you could give us just a very quick summary of what is a 13F filing? Well, you'll have heard of the SEC. It's the Securities and Exchange Commission. Basically the police force for all things kind of US sort of markets and finance, if you like, um, the regulator. Um, So they have this um, requirement. So if you're an investor, um, if you're an institutional investor, I should say. So an institutional investor, investment manager. And if you've got at least 100 million bucks under management, then you have to disclose your equity holdings um, on a quarterly basis. And you've got to air your washing and tell everyone exactly what you've done. What have you bought? What have you sold? What are your current holdings? So, yeah, all the big boys um, every quarter get forced to uh, basically flash their portfolio or their trading book and, and everyone gets to see what they've been up to. So so when you do your own one, then, uh, how <laughs> long does it take you typically? <laughs> uh, I go also. under, I go under, well, I, you know, some people do call me the sage of Balaam. <laughs> I've been known by at least one person has called me that okay in my life okay taking the piss um <laughs> well let, let's talk about warren buffett because he is one that 
generates a lot of headlines um, because the type of companies that he invests in, his investing style. So maybe we can touch on a few of these things. Um, the biggest headline came because he's put on a new position in a company called TSMC, where he purchased just over four billion US dollars in the Taiwanese chip maker. Um, other foreign investors, just to give a bit of perspective, do include US asset managers like BlackRock, Vanguard, the Singapore Sovereign Wealth Fund. So who is this company then? Why, why are all these big movers and shakers got a vested interest in that firm? Uh, well, yeah, they're a Taiwanese-based um, uh, chip maker. And I mean, more than that, they're the largest chip manufacturer on the planet. Uh, so this isn't like a, a kind of shot in the dark kind of, um, you know, trying to pick up a sort of small company that no one's heard about yet. This is the biggest player on the whole planet. Um, it's an interesting one. Basically, Buffett is notoriously anti-tech just because I, I think, well, clearly he's been wrong in that position for the last two decades. but. It's really a function of probably age, um, you would say. I mean, this guy, how old is Buffett now? Do you know, is he, he's well, no, I, I know how old he is. So what do you reckon? I believe, well, he's about 148, isn't he? Uh, he's close. He's, he's like, uh, he's got, is he in his 90s yet? I think he is, no? He is indeed, yeah. Go on, how old? 92. Wow. That's just crazy. But... Uh, <laughs> So he started investing, yeah, like like literally, yeah, you know, aftermath of the Second World War, he basically began his career. Um, so of course, tech didn't really exist, you know, really. And so, you know, he, he's kind of old school, um, traditional. He's a value investor. He's not a trader per se. He he believes in the ultra long term. So he will buy, buy and hold. Um, my Lord, can he hold? Um, <laughs> one of his famous, uh, well, probably well, maybe his most famous, although it's perhaps Apple's taking this mantle these days, but one of his most famous uh, investments is Coca-Cola. Um, and that that's currently still ranks yeah, fourth. Yeah, fourth still in fourth his in his portfolio. Uh, he owns just a casual 400 million shares um, of Coke. But he's been an investor in Coke, like literally for decades and decades and decades. Um, and, you know, so it's buy and hold. Um, it's picking solid companies. He, he really wants to find really solid management teams, because if he's holding for the long term, it's critical that the management team in place is good enough to execute on, on that kind of long term growth strategy. Right. So, yeah, he's typically quite conservative. And so the tech thing, yeah, I think he'll admit probably himself that he didn't quite get the tech era right. Um, but he did, you know, aggressively move into Apple. Um, but only recently, I think it was 2018, wasn't it, that he started hoovering up uh, yeah, well, as much wasn't Apple it, wasn't shares. It bad yeah. timing, was it? <laughs> well, no, true, good point. I mean, uh, but, uh, you know, he should have picked that horse in the noughties, right? Not, not by 20 years. I mean, I think he would admit he should have been in that like straight after the GFC would have been a sensible time. But you might, you might be uh, old enough. I'll be careful with my, how I word this. When IBM was seen as like yeah. the tech company to take things to a whole new level. Yeah. That he was invested in IBM for a long yeah. time. So actually, yeah, that's a really good point. I think that probably was an experience that mm. burnt him. And yeah, probably then that impacted his decision. I mean, this is like classic yeah. psychology, trading psychology, right? You're getting um, sort of, you probably say overly negatively impacted by a specific experience. Then you then carry that with you when you make future decisions and yeah, I think that IBM trade that went wrong, yeah, probably meant it delayed his move into tech. Um, so his portfolio is very much, it's very you know, non-tech, right? Until Apple, I mean, is Apple a tech company? I mean, of course it is, but um, 
Anyway, Apple's now his biggest holding. But I think with this um, this Taiwanese semiconductor um, trade, perhaps it is. Well, I think there's. I think two things about it. Number one, maybe he's just now looking to add to his kind of tech, um, the tech portion of his portfolio, just to very gradually pivot, continue that pivot that started with the Apple trade, to evolve, update, modernize the look of his portfolio that's 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 looking pretty old, right? Um, I think that's one thing. But then what I will say on the other side, I don't know if he's taking too much risk here because who is TSMC's biggest client? Who's their biggest customer? Apple. Hmm. So who's Warren Buffett's biggest holding in? Apple and Apple that's Apple's biggest supplier full stop Apple's biggest supplier is this Taiwanese chip company so now Buffett's waded in there as well so mm. either he's like doubling down on his Apple trade or maybe this is a strategic play yeah maybe Tim Cook has had a little whisper in his hit in his yeah. ear maybe after a board meet, an Apple board meeting, they uh, <laughs> trotted off for a few glasses of red wine, and uh, Tim Cook just uh, kind of persuaded him to strategically move into a position of authority on the TSMC board, mm. just to cement that supplier and to kind of strengthen ties, if you like, in in a world where, of course, semiconductors they're hard to come by these days, right? Obviously, that was front and center of the supply chain issues. Um, Maybe there's something in it around that angle. I don't know. What do you think? Mm. Well, sh surely, though, um, the regulators have got to have a problem with that from a competition perspective in regards to fair play for other chip makers if he's in bed with both. Yeah. But so, but which regulator? Because mm. this is obviously a US... Well, it, Buffett's just an investor, right? He would say... Um, he doesn't own a controlling stake in any of these companies. Um, so it's not illegal for an investor to buy shares into companies that are connected from a sort of business perspective. That's not illegal. Mm. Um, so I don't know how you would, how the regulator I would prove. Tim, Tim Cook's too big for any US regulator. Well, it, indeed. So big tech runs Washington, no? Yeah. <laughs> So what was that regulator? What was that? Pipe down, pipe down over there. I'm in charge. Yeah. Uh, 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 on that point, one talking of regulators, remember when Elon Musk, he's been doing his deposition about his pay or something, isn't it? Mm -hmm. At the moment about his salary. And he's been doing like pre trial work. Cause he's going to the same is it Delaware court where um, he lost a ruling with Twitter. Right. And one of the things that came up was um, he he apologized. He said, oh, when I said, um, you know, about oh, SEC, SEC is an acronym and the middle word is Elon's. <laughs> and he said, oh, no, no, no. I didn't mean suck Elon's cock. <laughs> what I meant was save Elon's company. Uh, he stood there in a court of law and said, straight faced, no, you've misconstrued my tweet. It meant save Elon's company. <laughs> I mean, this guy uh, is just... That's funny. Brilliant. Um, there is another angle. So I was just looking here. Obviously, we have the situation with the US and China in terms of... Mm. Well, is it escalating tensions? Um, some journalists might write and, you know, where that goes. And obviously, China and and their position around Taiwan and is Xi Jinping looking to eye up a move there or not? Um, but Apple were talking to other chip maker suppliers like during COVID, it was like, there's no chips anywhere, you know, where else can we get some from? And apparently Apple were talking to uh, Yangtze Memory Technologies, uh, which is a mainland uh, China based chip maker. Um, but because of the escalating tensions, um, Apple decided to veer away from them and go a bit more. I mean, TSMC were already their biggest supplier, but I think they've gone even bigger 
they put even more eggs in one basket, which isn't a great strategy from a supply chain diversity perspective. But maybe maybe uh, Buffett is is just maybe it is just an investment play, a trade where he feels that TM, TSMC might benefit somehow from this uh, if the China US sort of tensions do escalate. So that's another angle for you. Mm. I was just trying to have a quick look while you were talking of who else does TSMC supply mm. to? I'd be interested to see what that client base looks like and whether there's any connection in that way amongst those firms. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, Samsung would be the immediate one I would want to know about. If, if, there, are, if there are a major supplier for Samsung, Apple's arch rivals uh, or not i don't know the answer to that mm. okay well but, to, to but buffett's well hang on buffett's uh, look at his other so i'm just looking well check out like people listening if you check out anthony chung's linkedin uh then he did a good post on this a couple of days ago where you can get the full listing um that's the 13f filing i mean which is basically just a spreadsheet of buffett's holdings um, how many shares, um, what's the value of those shares, and then how that's changed over the last quarter. So it's interesting, like the top five holdings then, Apple, number one. Um, and I, actually, he's the biggest He's the biggest single shareholder, right, of Apple. I believe so, yeah. 126 um, and a half billion. <laughs> decent size. <laughs> uh, Bank of America is his second biggest holding. Then it, but that's that's down to 30 billion. So Apple really is like by far and away easily his biggest, biggest trade at the moment. But yeah, Bank of America at 30 billion. You've got Chevron then at 23 billion, Coca-Cola, 22 and a half billion. Um, so those top four there, that's good diversity, right? Apple is tech, Bank of America is obviously finance. You've got Chevron oil company, and then you've got Coca-Cola, which is you know, a, a consumer sort of discretionary product, you might say. Um, so his top four, there's good diversity. Then he's got Amex or his fifth. Um, then Occidental uh, Petroleum, which is another oil company. You've got Kraft Heinz, Moody's. Um, he took a chunk out of his Activision Blizzard trade, so booking a bit of profit on that. Um, and then US Bank Corp. And look, there's 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 loads of others. He's got, what, about 50-odd um holdings in his portfolio um but yeah the taiwanese semiconductor addition uh grabbed the headlines but yeah apple's still the uber trade that he's still playing mm. so when he's looking at a portfolio composition like this yeah is there any like um geographic risk with all of those names you were talking through I mean, I haven't had enough time to go through this. Definitely the flavor of this is big time American, which A, makes sense he's an American investor. B, makes sense because, well, America's the biggest economy. C, makes sense because American companies, you know, just from their globalization have probably benefited more than most in terms of value uh, creation and value add. So, <clears throat> of course, there's a massive US theme running all the way through. I'm just trying to pick out some other international holdings other than that Taiwanese semiconductor. Um, something here I haven't heard of, to be fair, like Liberty Media. I'm not familiar with them. Uh, they're all mo mostly they're really big companies. I mean, he took, took some of his uh, General Motors trade off, for example. He um, you know, he owns things like Visa, which I don't think so. The thing is, I think the stuff like Visa and, and Amex is a really big holding of his. Like, that's been hurting. And I wonder whether that he's probably been invested in Visa for like 40 years or something. And I just think that kind of thing is a bit, it's probably a bit of an obsolete dinosaur in this fintech, uh, fintech payments aggressive competition in, in that kind of payment space that Visa seem to be way off the pace on. So um, I think he's stubbornly holding out. I guess for him, you have like the book value of a position and then his current value. So the book value is what you bought it at. 
And then the current value is obviously the current value. And I guess for him, if he bought it like 40 years ago, the book value is basically zero. So it still looks like an amazing trade, even though, yeah, Visa haven't been doing well over the last few years. But, um, but yeah, it's overwhelmingly American. So you really, in terms of global or international risk, you've got to start to delve into each individual you know, big American um, multinational and start to think about, right, where does that individual company have international exposure? Um, and look, Apple top of that list. I mean, Apple are very exposed to China, right? In terms of iPhone sales, um, China's a, a very, very key market for them. So, um, yeah, China yeah. risk is certainly very present in his portfolio. Yeah, and just to kind of surmise berkshire's long only equity portfolio from a total number declined from 300 to 296 billion yeah in quarter three yeah yeah that's good going yeah <laughs> i mean so that i lost about 10 that's 10 percent, right uh sorry that's one percent no, no, no. what we're talking about one percent yeah. yeah to be one percent down in quarter three you'd definitely take that yeah <laughs> because <laughs> the indexes got crunched i don't know what the quarter three uh like s p performance was to be honest but it's definitely a, a bigger loss than one percent that's for sure yeah do you know the secret to um buffett's long life and uh... doesn't he doesn't he eat at that uh like budget american diner just down the road from his house once yeah. a week or something still does I think Once that's a week, the every yeah. day. It was every day. He has, yeah. he has a cheeky Maccas <laughs> to start his day every day. I think he gets like, um, you know, like the the four dollar meal, the bre breakfast wrap. And does uh, he? I'm just looking. I can't see McDonald's. You you talking about McDonald's here? Yeah, he gets a McDonald's. Is he McDonald's? He, he he owns McDonald's, surely. I'm just looking. I can't. I'm just glancing down the list. I cannot see any Mackey D's in this portfolio. Maybe oh, you used doing? to have. Spending all that, those $3 for the last <laughs> 500 years. He must have had at some point, right? Maybe he uh, <laughs> exited that a while back. But yeah, it's not in there now on first glance. Okay. I'm just having a quick look. Uh... So for the, the Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway owned just over 30 million shares of McDonald's. That was a stock split. I'm assuming this was a few years ago, though. So yeah, yeah he was in it. Maybe he's he switched it up now. He's going Burger King these days. <laughs> but, um, all right, well, look, let's move the show on and, and talk about uh, the UK economics because we've just had the, the budget. <laughs> Very different to the last one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just a bit. So, yeah, a couple of things then. Feel free to jump in at any point. So I'll just run through or rattle off. Uh, there's a lot to it. Try to just pick out some of the main ones that are more, uh, I guess, relevant on the finance side. So yep. for the economy, uh, the OBR predict the economy will shrink by 1.4% next year. The Chancellor did acknowledge we're in a recession. Things are going to get worse before they improve. So I think... Um, from the optics, they've definitely taken the angle, him and Rishi, of trying to make this sound like the worst economic times ever to manage to appropriately lower the bar of people's expectations, which I think is probably a sensible approach. Yeah. Um, rather than just going gun ho, let's just go rapid growth, which was the previous strategy. Yeah. Um, other things, all workers face paying more in tax as a freeze on the personal allowance, basic and higher thresholds. It's been extended to 2028. Um, that's when they were, the papers, you'll read about it, call that the stealth tax by pushing that out. Uh, the point at which the highest earners start paying top rate of tax has been lowered to 125K from 150. Chancellor Hunt also confirms that the energy industry will be hit with an expanded windfall tax. So that's going up to 35 and 25%. Very much broadcasted though, uh, about a week ago, that figure, yeah. in fact. So nothing new there. 
Support for energy bills is expected to remain in place, but become less generous from April. We already knew that stat as well. Uh, the 12,300 tax-free allowance for capital gains tax is going to get halved to 6K. Um, and then your EV is not going to be exempt yeah. from vehicle excise duty as of April 25. Not happy about that. <laughs> and then there's not going to be any change to the remit of the Bank of England, of which on any other day I'd say, why do I need to know that? But you need to know that because uh, our friends Trust and Quirteng were actually talking about a bit of a, a shakeup of the Bank of England uh, and their oversight capability. But um, the chance was quite quick today, Jeremy Hunt, to come out and squash that. So from a market's perspective, intraday, there hasn't, hasn't been one in terms of a, a reaction, but you, it's very normal for that to, to happen um, if from a trading side of things. But yeah, any any thoughts um, on what's been announced today? Well, the pound is coming off a little bit, but actually it's a bit more dollar strength than anything. The, the, the dollar strengthening against most currency pairs today. So the pound, the sterling versus the dollar is down 1%, but then the Aussie dollar against the US dollar is down one3 Kiwi against the dollar is down 1.1%. So, you know, it, there is dollar strength theme today. So if all you did was looked at the pound versus the dollar and you go, oh my God, it's coming down you, and, and don't look at anything else, you might draw the conclusion that the pound is devaluing because of this budget. If, if anything, the pound is, is, is losing less value against the dollar than other currencies. So maybe there's a little bit of sterling positivity in there. There's just more dollar positivity overall. But um, look, this statement, I don't think there's much... You know, it's been well telegraphed. Obviously, we've been waiting for this uh, statement for the last few weeks. And yeah, I mean, I, I think more broadly, obviously, they had to come in and rescue the carnage, uh, the disaster of the Trust Quasi show. And so they've pivoted and gone right to the other end of the spectrum. And look, from a fiscal, you know, fr from a UK government debt perspective. Um, this will puts us on a better uh, kind of trajectory uh, to be able to, you know, sort out our fiscal situation where we obviously had to borrow a lot of money to fund all of the emergency stuff in COVID, you know, all of the furloughing and all the rest of it. I mean, you know, it's the biggest fiscal sort of bailout in the history of mankind right so you've got to start to pay for it at some point it's just that these guys have said well let's just start paying for it now and, and let's just and look whilst interest rates are high this makes sense i think if you had this plan pre-covid definitely wouldn't have made sense you know it makes sense when interest rates are low to go fiscally expansive you know let's invest and borrow it to invest because borrowing is cheap but when borrowing is expensive, yeah, you've got to pivot and change the, 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 the direction. And so they've definitely done that aggressively here. Um, yeah, one thing like just thinking from our markets, a trading or investment point of view, um, then he has gone a little bit like some of the surprises in here, like capital gains tax. He's gone at that, I think, harder than I was expecting. So this is important for investors mm. because uh, investors here in the UK, you have to pay capital gains tax on any profits from shares, right? So if you, you know, if you buy shares and then sell them for a profit, you get taxed on that. Um, and there was a annual tax-free allowance. So it was the case that you used to be able, the first £12,300 worth of profit is tax-free. And then it's only after that you start to get capital gains taxed on that. Capital gains tax is like just shy of 30%. So it's you know, a decent whack to your profit. That's why a lot of these investment companies have a huge amount of uh, sort of tax. There's a huge tax strategy element to the investment process to try and protect their clients from, or well, not protect them, but try and be tax savvy when it comes to you know, managing and exiting trades and so on. So, so that capital gains free tax allowance, 12,300, it's being halved or more than halved. 
to 6,000. Um, that's in April 23. Then in April 2024, it's getting halved again. So it'll just be 3,000 pounds worth of capital gains tax allowance by April 2024. So that's definitely important for investors. Um, then also um, dividend tax. So, um, you know, if you run a sort of limited company, then some of the director's uh, remuneration packages will include dividends. Um, and here, what Hunt has done is, um, again, made that less tax efficient. So we've ha he's halved the free dividend uh, tax allowance. It used to be £2,000. He's halved it to 1000 So a couple of things in there from a sort of investor's point of view that kind of um, stood out to me. But but yeah, I don't. Other than that, look, we we knew what was coming, right? I think that cut to the the threshold for the higher rate. I well, I didn't read anything about that prior to today. Maybe I missed it, but that's where he's low. Yeah, you have got to pay forty five percent tax now on anything above one hundred and twenty five thousand. It used to be anything above one hundred and fifty. What's quite notable about that is, of course, that quasi. Um, had the master plan of removing that tax threshold entirely. Don't worry, guys, you don't have to pay 45%, just pay 40 that, How does that happen? Like, I'm not saying one person's right or wrong. We all know who was right or wrong. But, <laughs> yeah. but how can you be that off key? I just don't get it. Like, how did that happen? And like... Well, it's because trust and quasi quarting were in their little bubble they were in a parallel universe mm. together on their own you know concocting their master plan didn't consult anyone didn't tell anyone because they thought i in my opinion i mean i've never met these guys so i'm spouting opinions here without without ever having met them but it looks to me like it's arrogance mm. that they thought like i don't know what you want to call it um academic or you know academic arrogance where they think that i know better than everyone else so i do not need to consult them we have the master plan da da here you go guys and then the whole thing collapses and then they go oh we mm. thought that was going to work ah okay so really hunt and rishi i mean don't forget rishi who's the prime minister don't forget him in all of this so he was running against trust very much on a mandate that was much more fiscally prudent. So trust's fiscal expansionary mandate got shot down. So we're back to Rishi's fiscal prudent mandate with Hunt coming in, and they've just gone even more prudent because they've decided, having seen the evidence from Truss's example, that that's definitely the wrong direction. Let's pivot and go more aggressively the other way because that's what people and markets are like. I guess that's their play. And you were talking about uh, interest rates and how that can play into and influence the fiscal strategy. So one thing was Morgan Stanley, they issued their latest call for UK rates. So mm -hmm. they basically say that the Bank of England will cut interest rates by 150 basis points in 2024 um, stopping their tightening cycle, which they see UK rates will hit 4% in March. So I disagree with that second part. I disagree. I, I mean, I would like the Bank of England to stop raising rates right now. And I know that's hard to do. We'll talk about inflation in a minute. It's hard to do when inflation yet again makes another 40-year high. Um, but this, this budget is deflationary. So we're in a recession. Demand destruction is happening right now. They do not need to hike rates anymore. They've done enough, in my view. So I wouldn't be hiking from 3% where we are now. I wouldn't be hiking another 1% by March, which is what Morgan Stanley thinks. I, I think that would be an error. But we'll see. I'm happy to go head to head with Morgan Stanley. Okay. We'll see who's right. Okay, I'll, I'll see if I can get what's his name, Mike. Yeah. Mike Wilson. You can battle it out for your yeah. Let's do it. 2023 S and P call, but um, 
Let's talk about inflation then. You mentioned it there. UK inflation yeah. did hit a, a new high. It was higher than expected. Um, I think it was expected at 10.7, came in 11.1, up from 10.9%. So, yeah, big figure, higher since 1981. The core reading, though, was unchanged. So worth mentioning that. That was at 6.5%. So, yeah, how do you, how do you see that? Well... I was at uh, yesterday. I was at um, I was out out on the road. I've been out on the road the last few days, um, just out there on the front line, mm. um, running some of our simulations. Um, and I was actually at Loughborough University, and um, I was there yesterday morning. And I brought the FT up. And I was looking at it with them, just trying to show them how I would read the FT, right? And I think that's, because sometimes, hopefully, it's quite insightful for students just because the FT is such a monster publication. It's hard to really know mm. how to kind of, what's the best angle of attack. But I flashed it up, and obviously, the big headline, 11.1%, you know, highest for 41 years. Yeah. And I said, and then I took the, I took the FT off, and I asked them, what do you think has happened to the FTSE 100 today, this morning? with all this data and these headlines. And they said, oh, it's definitely gone down. FTSE's definitely gone down. So I got the chart up. FTSE was up 0.2%. Yeah. <laughs> and I was trying to make two points. Number one, be super careful about sensationalist media clickbait headlines. Mm. Um, don't just react to the headline and then make all your assumptions and decisions. Click in and actually read the body of the article, where then it goes into more detail about, yes, inflation is at 11.1%. Yes, it is a 40-year high. But when you take out food and energy, the core inflation number was unchanged from September at 6.5%. Now, 6.5% is really, really, really high. But the fact that it didn't rise from the month before um, on the core level, I think is really important. Um, and is the more important point, okay? And that's why the FTSE 100 wasn't selling off in the face of this sensationalist headline. You know, basically do your own due diligence on it before, you know, just having that trigger-happy reaction to media headlines. Yeah, so to add to that, what happens on a monthly basis is that Bloomberg will conduct their own polls. And so Bloomberg being the benchmark terminal system of all the institutional players, they'll survey economists and they'll say, what do you think about where UK inflation will be by, at this time? Or in this case, they put one out midweek saying, where do you think UK house prices, what's going to happen? And the headline that Bloomberg have been pumping this week is UK house prices risk a drop of up to 20%. And so obviously you see UK house prices 20% and you think, Jesus, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a big downward move. But then you actually read it. That's not what they're predicting. That's worst case scenario. Right. So exactly Perfect. as you exactly. were saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's definitely, you definitely yeah, need to have breadth, I think, in your uh, aggregation of information. And then the ability to be curious minded to then um, investigate. I guess yeah. that's the, the way to do it. Right. Absolutely. Um, but I've got, so really it was all on the food and energy side, right? This continued upside inflation. So number one on the energy side, well, the price caps in now, right? The UK government has just capped two and a half thousand pound cap, right? So that's now in as of this month, meaning the energy portion of the inflation basket will not go up for six months. So if you're thinking about inflation in the future, should the Bank of England raise rates or not? Well, the, one of the big contributors, energy, that's just hit a ceiling and can't go any higher. Anyway, they can't do anything about energy costs. It doesn't matter what you do with interest rates. It's a supply side issue, right? Um, so that's one thing. The other thing on the food side, now some of the food stuff just went gangbusters. Um, I've got some, I've got, got a little quiz to play with you. Uh, I've got you, some food. You do you realize I'm a, I'm a vegan? <laughs> that's fine. I've got so. Oh, yeah. Have I got any vegan products in my list here? <laughs> no, no. Go for it. Um, what have you got? So 
like when you're walking the aisles in your mm. um where you're what are you waitrose MS food probably right <laughs> Little, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so the, that's a that's a good point, right? Where are you buying your produce from? Well, so there's a big difference. Yes, but I've got stats here in terms of, on average, how much okay. of the price of certain goods gone up. Okay, so, um, and I'll give you a hint. Overall, the food component of the basket was up sixteen point seven percent year on year. Okay, mm. so obviously that's I know, that's I the average. That. I feel that every week. That's the average. Um, you, uh, you're you a you're a semi-skimmed milkman, I'm, no, I'm guessing. No, no, no. Low fat? No, no, no. How much has milk gone up in the last 12 months? 12 months? Yeah. 45%. Price of milk. Say again? 45%. Ooh, that's close. 47.9% milk is up. Uh, what about your butter? What do you think? Oh, that's probably even more, because every time I, I buy a tub of that... <laughs> I just think, what? <laughs> well, have, have I bought like detergent or something like that? Like, why is that so expensive? But yeah, well, butter's up forty-two point one. Okay. Um, pasta and couscous. Well, I'm just going to read all these off. Oh, it's just pasta, all, all your essentials here, isn't it? This pasta is just... and couscous up thirty-four percent. Do you like your like sauces and your condiments? Oh, of course. Um, They've they've shot up thirty three percent. Oil, like olive oils and fats and stuff, up thirty three. Flowers up twenty one percent. Eggs so, up twenty two. Does anything top milk or is milk? No, milk is the, milk's the milk's the big top one. Of the list. Yeah. Um, so these are crazy numbers, right? Um, on an annualized basis, and yeah. So this is one. This is like the key driver at the moment of that in the inflation basket. Um, along with energy. But as I said, that energy component is not going to be driving higher from this point on. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. And look, we've got demand destruction. We got, we're got we in a recession. And I know these are all sort of everyday items that I'm listing here. Um, it's difficult with stuff like milk, I guess, and, and like milk and eggs and flour. I mean, I guess that's they're definitely consumer staples, right? You're not you're not going to not buy those, but maybe you'll be a bit more conscious of how much milk you're putting on your cereal. Um, cereals are up 14.4%, by the way. So yeah, that breakfast uh, portion might just get reduced a little so, bit. So when you hear like inflation is at 11%, is that not actually a reflection for the majority of people? where they've pulled back on a lot of these other more surplus type spending activities. So their core consumption, which is those staples, it isn't 11%. Yeah. If you average out yeah. those main typical, like yeah. when I go, let's say I, go, I do my weekly shop, I buy 10 items, let's say it's all yeah. the ones you just said, right. But that's not 11%. No, so it's more like my spending for the month. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. All right. Well, look, let's, um, I was going to say that let's take this in a more positive direction, but <laughs> we're going to talk about Donald Trump. <laughs> DJT. Yeah. He has announced he's going to run for the presidency 2024. He said, America's comeback starts right now. That's right. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he, he had hoped. So the context here, he had hoped that the party's expected gains, um, I say expected gains were going to act as a bit of a springboard for his party's nomination. He was backing a whole host of candidates going into these midterm elections uh, last week. And obviously that has not panned out at all in the right way for him. It's been criticized quite, quite heavily for that. Um, but let's just get a few things straight because just because he says he wants to run for presidency, that doesn't mean it's now him, Biden, little face off and off we go again. He has to win the Republican Party's nomination. I was trying to think of the stat. I did see it. If a president was to go and then come back again, I don't think that's happened for... It's over a century. I was right. reading that. It's a long time. Yeah. So, so this process then, what comes next? Because obviously we're talking about 2024 here. Yeah, um, November 24, yeah. Right. So... It typically starts at least one year before voters go to the polls. So 
yeah, you, you, it's going to start ramping up basically really from now, certainly in terms of the noises that he's likely to be making. Uh, each party candidate is chosen through a series of state contests or primaries. Each candidate is assigned a number of delegates proportional to the number of votes that they won in the state. Um, and then those delegates go on to vote for them at the party's presidential nominating convention. That's that's normally like a big uh, star-studded event and you know, yeah. it's a big convention. Um, along the way, candidates uh, get to compete in these kind of grueling debates that get highly publicized against each other, members within their own party, which I always find that a bit weird. It's like, because the American political uh, kind of play is just so much more aggressive. It's not like uh, the Hugh Grant British style when we all there go, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> got stumbling through. It's uh, they go at it like toe yeah. to toe. Um, so currently a major rival is a, is a chap called Ron DeSantis, uh, who's Florida's governor who swept to a re-election. And so whilst everyone else was struggling, uh, he just smashed it. Uh, and straight away, Trump came out, gave him a tongue lashing. Um, well, you know what Trump calls him? Go on. He calls him Ron De Sanctimonious. <laughs> he, he lacks loyalty. Trump said, yeah, okay. he's, um, and he's an average governor, not, not who you need. Um, so yeah, that, I mean, that's the, the general process. I mean, wh where are we with Trump and Musk? And I asked that that's because a, a really important um, piece of the puzzle for Trump's success is can he get himself back on there? Because the two of them kind of were buds and then they fell out. Yeah, because Elon was an advisor to the administration when he was in power, right? Yeah, for slightly dubious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that aside, they've kind of fallen out more recently. But with his necessity to get on, because his own company, his own social platform, truth, truth social is uh, yeah. just not going to cut it. Yeah, I mean. I haven't heard anything. I don't think Musk has made any comments yet about, right, will Trump be reinstated or not? I think in his general idea, that's Musk's general idea, is that people should not be permanently hmm. um, cancelled from Twitter. You know, there can be temporary bans for transgressions or whatever, but, you know, there shouldn't be permanent bans. So obviously that implies Trump is going to come back, but when, who knows, right? But I don't know. I just feel a bit depressed about Trump and the fact he's coming back. Um, this is how I see it. Like, if you think about the US electorate, there's two, they're very divided. I'm not necessarily talking about Republican and Democrats anymore. I think it's basically you've got the Trump, you know, supporter who's die hard. Right. And they will do anything, anything, and they'll storm the Capitol for Donald. Right. They will, they, they will never vote for anyone else. If Trump's running, they're all in. Okay. He then got everyone else who's not a Trump supporter. And I think it's so divisive that they're not quite as passionately negative as Trump's supporters are positive, but they're pretty damn negative about Trump. And so they'll never vote for Trump. OK, now the problem Trump has is most hardcore passionate. There's a lot of them, but they make up a minority. So I actually don't think Trump can win because he's those that were middle ground like in the last election. Those that were middle ground, or the election before, sorry, when he won, those that were middle ground, you know, did lean and shifted towards Trump, but I think he's now alienated the middle ground. I mean, you saw what happened in the midterms. Um, a couple of the prominent um, guys that Trump had um, endorsed, so Mehmet Oz in Pennsylvania and then someone called Carrie Lake in Arizona, they were like favorites to win. Trump had backed them, um, but then they failed and they'd massively underperformed. So Trump's endorsement actually ended up proving to be a bit of a negative and a tainting their campaign. There's obviously been a big female vote swing against those kind of, 
you know, far right Republican anti-abortion type candidates, um, the female votes really swung aggressively against them. So I think that whole middle ground has gone for Trump. Um, so therefore, I actually don't think he can win. What the Republicans need to do, I think, is they need to put Trump away. And they need to look forwards. And actually, a lot of the supporters, I mean, here's a, a so Blackstone, um, the founder of Blackstone is a guy called Stephen Schwarzman. Um, he was a massive Trump fan, even after the storming of the Capitol when Trump was saying the vote's been rigged. This guy was still supporting Trump, saying Trump's right. So he was a bit of a diehard, right? Obviously, an incredibly wealthy man, one of Trump's biggest um, financial donors during the 2020 campaign. Even he's turned now. His quote was, America does better when its leaders are rooted in today and tomorrow rather than today and yesterday. So like Trump is yesterday's man. They need to modernize, move forwards. Um, De Santos, he's your man. If they want to win the next election, they need De Santos to be up there. I think they'll lose it with Trump. Whether Whoever the Republicans pick, it is then important to say, well, who's going to be the Democratic Party um, candidate? And it might not be Biden. Right. And by although after the that, midterms, that would, yeah, that would play into Ron's hands, though, going against would. Biden. Right. It's like a perfect polarization oh, of candidates. That's right. The Republicans, are, they would love it if the Santos was up against Biden and Biden would get eaten alive. I think mm -hmm. um, the problem the Democrats have is because they did better than expected in the midterms. Biden now is feeling a bit more positive about himself and is maybe going to announce that he is going to run for a second term. But mm. Well, one thing I was just looking at was the last Fed economic projections, because where is the economy anticipated to be by 2024 is also going to be quite crucial, particularly where we're at now, which has been the height, if you like, of the fear of recession. We're going to get that economic kind of follow through in the short period ahead. But where will we be in 2024? And if you look at the change in real GDP growth uh, for the end of this year, the Fed are expecting growth of 0.2%. By 2024, yeah. back up to 1.7%. Yeah. Climbing from 0.2 to 1.2 next year to 1.7. So ever increasing GDP growth. Unemployment, they see peaking next year at two at four point four percent and then staying at that level through 24 and then core pce inflation or uh, let's go pc inflation they see 5.4 percent the end of this year right and that's a peak because then they see a dramatic decline to 2.8 percent in 2023 and then down to 2.3 percent by the times really the the mid the um the election is in the end of 2024. So, yeah. yeah, does does that help? Because yeah, it's a better, way better situation than what it, the beginning of next year is going to look like. It helps the Democrats. Yeah, I, I think based on economic cycles and durations mm -hmm. of recessions and all the rest of it, it's likely, pretty damn likely, that in the run into the election, so let's say through the summer of 2024, you're probably going to get the economy rebounding and that that recovery phase after a recession is often like the fastest growth phase and you know this is why like equity prices go up the fastest and so if the democrats are lucky and based on previous cycles most likely they'll be going into that election the, the last part of the election race really buoyed by a rebounding economy yeah which could play into their their favor yeah all right. Well, look, to wrap things up, last thing I did promise at the beginning, I'd tell you who's going to win <laughs> the World Cup. And so I have it on very good authority that England are going to make the final. <sighs> so close. <sighs> but they're going to come up short again, losing to your favourite, David David Beckham, little kick out David Beckham in Argentina. Argentina. Yeah. Actually, well, I, I haven't read this guy's 
Uh, so, I, so yeah, where where does this come from? There's yeah. there's this analyst called Joachim Clement who works for um, Librum. I think that's how you you say the firm he works for. But essentially, you'll you'll see a lot of this in the press, kicking off probably in the next coming days because yeah. Goldman's has one, Morgan Stanley will put out one, which is when they have this kind of engagement piece where they'll get some of their analysts to run the models like they would do for a financial analysis to punch out then different variables to calculate any anticipated pathways for different countries in the World Cup performance. And this guy, his, his model, which uses economic and, and climactic variables, <laughs> apparently, uh, such as GDP per capita, population sizes, these sorts of things to predict team successes, he called the correct winners at the last two major or last major tournaments, 2014, um, 2018, with Germany and France. Um, he has said that the three lions will breeze past Senegal, Mexico, and Portugal in the knockout phase, but lose to Argentina in the final. I mean, these guys, <laughs> GDP per capita is one of his key variables in his model. Is he aware? But the greatest World Cup side of all time, the country that's won the most. Well, do you know the answer to that? That's won the most. Who's won the most World Cups? Brazil. Yes. Um, their GDP per capita is very low. Well, relatively low, right? Um, and yet they're the greatest side of all time. So I'm not quite sure there's room for... GDP per capita in a World Cup prediction model. Myself, the, the, the what do I know? What's the population of Brazil? It's about 180 million, isn't it? 150, is it? 214. That's oh, gone up. Yeah. Okay. It's quite punchy. Yeah. But I don't get the correlation GDP per capita to chances of winning the World Cup or not. Yeah, I haven't. I, I didn't make the model, Piers. <laughs> 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 I don't know what offsets he's using to like <laughs> level. I do agree though. Are the Ar the Argentines do look pretty tasty. I think that that's that's who I think will win. I don't have a model. That's, <laughs> that's called a hunch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and on that hunch, we'll wrap it up. So thanks as ever, Piers, and uh, thanks everyone for listening. Again, if you have made it to the end, you're probably one of our regular listeners. So thank you. Uh, please do, as I said, share this, get it out to uh, as many people as possible. Uh, you know, it's all aimed at trying to just help demystify really finance and investing for students and for uh, and for others as well, who just, you know, given, as I said at the beginning, the, the context of how the economy is at the moment, I think it's important that people have uh, education on these matters. So, all right, take care and we will see you next week. Yep. See you later.